Since its inception, Las Vegas has been portrayed as the epitome of opulence and luxury. While its reputation aided in transforming the city into what it is today, it has also negatively impacted Sin City. When the Great Recession of 2008 hit, no major city felt its devastating effects to the extent of Las Vegas. The majority of tourists could no longer afford to spend exorbitant amounts of money on travel, especially to places as highly priced as the Strip. Thus, tourism and casino revenues plummeted, leaving thousands without work. The recession also took a toll on multiple developments, leading to the bulk of these projects halting construction. One of the more notable failed strip projects was Echelon Place, now known as Resorts World. Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Jonas Stahl and welcome to Abandoned Explained. In today's video, we'll be taking a look into what led to the development of the strip's most recognizable reminder of the recession, Echelon Place. In order to provide you with a complete picture of what happened here, we must first cover the history behind the infamous Stardust Resort. Since I started this series, these two topics have been requested numerous times. Considering these two establishments directly affected one another, I thought it would be best to cover them both in one video. If you do not want to learn about the history behind the Stardust, skip to the timecode posted on screen. If you have any topics you'd want me to cover in this series, let me know down in the comments below. Also, if you enjoy the video at any point, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button. Anyways, let's dive right into it. During the early 1930s, a small railroad town known as Las Vegas passed a bill that forever changed the valley. In 1931, Nevada re-legalized gambling under the Wide Open Gambling Bill, thus laying the foundation for an economy that would transform the sleepy little town into a world-renowned tourist destination. Development was slow at first, however things picked up following the construction of the El Rancho Hotel in 1942. While this event seemed insignificant at the time, the El Rancho paved the road for future developments in Las Vegas. What many failed to realize was, the opening of the El Rancho marked the birth of the Las Vegas Strip. Throughout the 1950s, Las Vegas saw the development of a variety of casinos that eventually became strip icons such as the Mint, the Flamingo, and the Stardust. During the early 1950s, Tony Canero conceived a plan to construct a casino in Las Vegas shortly after recovering from an assault. Prior to moving to Las Vegas, Tony and his wife lived in Beverly Hills, California. On February 9th, 1948, while meeting with two potential investors for a casino project in Mexico, Tony received a knock on his door. After opening the door, he met a character who he assumed to be a delivery person. The man handed Tony a box and uttered the words, Here, Canero, this is for you, before shooting him in the abdominal region four times. Miraculously, Tony survived the assault. However, his deal with the investors he met fell through. After recovering from his injuries, Tony moved his family out to Las Vegas, Nevada. Once settled, Tony devised a plan to construct the world's largest casino resort, the Stardust Resort and Casino. After finalizing his plans, Tony purchased a 40-acre parcel of land on the Las Vegas Strip. Today, this section of land is located adjacent to the Circus Circus Hotel and Resort. Following his purchase, Canelro filed an application with the United States Security and Exchange Commission to sell stock in the property. Once approved, Tony bought 65,000 shares in the property for 10 cents apiece, making him the majority stockholder at 51%. He then sold the remaining stock and filed for a gaming license with the Nevada Gaming Commission. By 1955, construction was well underway on the project, which expected to have over 1,000 hotel rooms. Up until this point, construction on the project had mainly been financed by American gangster Mo Dalitz, who provided Tony with three loans, totaling to $4.3 million. As construction progressed, Canero encountered a major problem. The Nevada Gaming Commission refused to issue him a gaming license due to his extensive criminal history. In response to the sudden change of events, Tony struck a deal with investors led by the notorious illegal gambler from Los Angeles, Milton B. Farmer Page, to lease the Stardust for $500,000 per month. On July 31st, 1955, Canero encountered a string of bad luck that ultimately led to his demise. Within one night, he gambled away $37,000 on a craps table at the Desert Inn Casino. Adjusted for inflation, in one sitting, Tony managed to gamble away nearly $350,000. As the night went on, Tony and the dealer wound up in a heated argument over a $25 chip. According to the LVPD coroner's office, Canero suffered a massive heart attack and passed on before hitting the floor. Despite the coroner's statement, rumors began to circulate that someone had poisoned Tony's drink. Witnesses claimed that prior to authorities arriving on scene, employees removed Cronero's body from the casino. Witnesses also claim that the glass he drank from was immediately washed after his passing. Despite the suspicious details surrounding the death, police never performed an autopsy on Tony's corpse. Following Canero's death, John Factor, a con artist associated with the Chicago outfit, purchased the under construction resort for around $4 million. Once the purchase was finalized, Factor brought in the project's loan holder, Mo Dalitz, and the management team from the Desert Inn to run the resort. 
To complete construction on the resort, the new developers received a $10 million loan. On July 3, 1958, Tony's vision became a reality as the Stardust hosted their grand opening ceremony. The main star of the Stardust's grand opening was the Lido de Paris show at 9pm, the first topless French review production on the Strip. Upon opening, the Stardust became the largest resort on the Las Vegas Strip with the capacity to hold over 1,000 guests. The property sat on 40 acres of land, with rooms arranged into six buildings named after six different planets. Developers arranged the hotel structures in such a way that permitted at-door parking for every guest. Developers also soundproofed every room, a luxury provided by few casinos at the time. The luxuries afforded to guests made a stay at the Stardust one of a kind. While a room here only ran you six bucks a night, or fifty dollars when adjusted for inflation, guests were provided with countless amenities not offered anywhere else on the Strip. Guests here had access to 36 different services ranging from auto rentals to babysitters. The pool, otherwise known as the Big Dipper Pool, extended over 105 feet and set a world record for its size. The Stardust also offered rooms with individual temperature controls, a rare luxury at the time. The Stardust boasted one of the largest casino floors on the Strip, spanning 16,500 square feet. To put this into perspective, the largest casino floor on the Strip today is at the Venetian Resort, which is approximately 138,000 square feet. The Stardust's original casino floor could fit inside the Venetian's casino eight times. Upon opening, the Stardust remained open 24-7 to keep up with the Las Vegas nightlife. In order to advertise the property, Factor knew he needed to create something completely original. While other casinos boasted prestigious circle drives, elaborate lawns, and massive fountains, the Stardust took a different approach. Factor installed the world's largest cantilever sign to advertise the resort. The sign spanned 215 feet and required an electrical input of 3,000 amps to operate. This high electrical input allowed the sign to be seen nearly three miles down the strip. The sign also set a world record for its immense size. Shortly after the Stardust's grand opening, the nearby casino Royal Nevada discontinued operations. Financial problems which plagued the project from the beginning eventually forced the resort to close only four years after opening. In response to the closure, the Stardust purchased and renovated the defunct property. The Royal Nevada was transformed into the Stardust West, which contained the convention center and the high roller suite. From 1959 to 1964, this wing became exclusively known for housing both high rollers and the Stardust showgirls. With the addition of the Royal Nevada, the Stardust now had the capacity to hold 1,300 guests. During its first years of operation, the Stardust owned the only drive-in theater in Las Vegas. Due to the circumstances, the Stardust drive-in became a popular hangout spot for teens and adults. The theater remained the only theater of its kind until 1965, when the West Wind Drive-In opened. By 1961, the Stardust employed a concerning amount of high-profile criminals. A few honorable mentions include credit manager Hy Goldbaum, who was known under 11 different aliases and had 14 criminal convictions including one for assault, casino manager Johnny Drew, a trusted associate of Al Capone, and general manager Morris Kleinman, who served three years for tax evasion. Mo Dalitz and his team leased the property until 1965, when they became the owners of the resort. From 1965 to 1970, Dalitz and his team operated the Stardust International Raceway in Spring Valley, which is part of the Las Vegas Township. The Speedway hosted racing events such as the Can-Am and the USAC Championship Car Series. World-class drivers like Mario Andretti, Bruce McLaren, Mark Donahue, and Jackie Stewart competed here during the Stardust's operation of the track. In 1966, eccentric billionaire Howard Hughes attempted to purchase the Stardust for $30.5 million. Hughes previously purchased the Desert Inn for $13 million, along with many other casinos including the Sands and New Frontier. His interest in the project stemmed from its reputation as the largest resort in Las Vegas. Before Dalitz could sell the project, the Justice Department Antitrust Division stepped in and shot down the deal. The Antitrust Division ruled that if Hughes acquired any more projects on the Strip, he would violate the Sherman Antitrust Act. During the late 1960s, the Stardust gave Siegfried and Roy their first shot as headliners on the Strip. Thanks to this, the entertainers gained popularity in Las Vegas for their performance with White Tigers and Lions. The pair eventually moved their act to the Mirage, selling out every show from the first night to the last. As the 60s came to an end, Dalitz sold the Stardust to the Parvin Dorman Corporation for an undisclosed amount. Parvin Dorman sat on the property for five years before selling it to Alan Glick's Argent Corporation in 1970. Alan Glick purchased the property using loans provided by the International Brotherhood of Teamsters Central States Pension Fund. Glick, a previous attorney and real estate investor from San Diego, received $100 million in loans from Teamsters Central State Pension Fund. Using this money, he first purchased the Hacienda Hotel, then Downtown Fremont Hotel, and finally the Stardust. If you've seen the movie Casino, this story may sound familiar. That is because the movie Casino is based off the story of the Stardust. If you substitute Stardust for Tangers, you know what happens next.
Under Argent's ownership, Frank Lefty Rosenthal became the unofficial boss of the casino, despite not having a gaming license. While some disliked Rosenthal's management style, the casinos all saw a massive spike in popularity. Rosenthal's ability to bring in high rollers resulted in a sizable increase in dealer tips. This alone made him a popular face on the casino floor. Rosenthal's most memorable addition to the Stardust was their $2 million sports and race book. The addition of this segment became the casino's most popular attraction due to their abnormally high betting limits. Nowhere else on the strip could you find a $100,000 maximum bet. At the time, competitors on the strip limited bets between $1,000 to $5,000. Supposedly, the payphones outside the sports book were the highest grossing in the country. Runners used the phones to inform out-of-state associates about the Stardust betting lines immediately after they were posted. The Stardust line became the industry standard up until the book's closure. While Rosenthal made the resort an unbelievable amount of money, he also oversaw a table and slot skimming operation at the Stardust. This operation led to millions of unreported revenue being sent to the Chicago Outfit and other crime families to fund their illegal enterprises. Inevitably, things came crashing down when federal investigators confirmed that throughout the 1970s, Stardust employees skimmed profit from the resort and distributed the funds between several Midwestern mob bosses. Investigators alleged that millions of dollars in revenue went unaccounted for and that the unaccounted revenue was distributed to criminal organizations before the Stardust reported their earnings. Towards the end of the 1970s, Argent Corporation started to face legal issues related to the skimming operation. Amidst the controversy, Argent sold the Stardust to Herb Tobman and Alan Sachs in 1979. Initially, things went well under the pair. However, authorities discovered that they too skimmed profits at the resort. In response, the Nevada Gaming Commission revoked their gaming licenses and forced them to forfeit control of the property. In 1984, the duo received a $3.5 million fine from the Nevada Gaming Commission. This fine set a record as the largest fine ever issued by the Nevada Gaming Commission. Due to the situation at hand, the commission awarded Boyd Gaming the rights to operate the day-to-day -day activities at the Stardust. In 1983, a federal grand jury indicted 15 people for conspiring to skim at least $1.6 million from the casino table games. Those indicted included notorious criminals such as the head of the Chicago outfit, Joseph Ayupa, Milwaukee syndicate boss Frank Balstrieri, and Kansas City mafia chief Carl Savella. Authorities later charged a group of Cleveland mobsters for sharing the stolen casino profits with other criminal organizations. Authorities estimated that the Stardust alone lost over $2 million. In federal court, Cleveland mobster Angelo Leonardo turned on his associates and testified against them. The mobster turned informant testified that his close friend, who was the Cleveland Mafia's point man, informed him that the mobsters from Kansas City and Milwaukee had considerable say in who the Teamsters pension fund issued loans to. He stated these mobsters convinced Teamster to issue a loan to Alan Glick's Argent Corporation. Leonardo also revealed that the Chicago, Milwaukee, Kansas City, and Cleveland crime families received monthly kickbacks from the Stardust skim, ranging between $40,000 to $100,000. He concluded his testimony by saying that the Teamster Union official William Presser received a $1,500 monthly pension from the skim. Before the hearing began, Kansas City Mafia chief Carl Savella and three others accepted a plea deal, thus pleading guilty to lesser charges. After the trial, the jury deliberated for 36 hours over a six-day period before coming to a decision. Chicago mob boss Joseph Ayupa and four others were convicted of skimming revenue while secretly controlling the Stardust Resort and Fremont Hotel. Each defendant was convicted on all eight counts, each of which carried a maximum penalty of five years in prison and a $10,000 fine. All four of those convicted were over the age of 57, the oldest being Iupa, who was 77 years old. Alan Glick, the man responsible for purchasing the Stardust and two other hotels on the Strip, played a key role in convicting those involved in the skimming operation. Glick claimed in court he had no knowledge of Frank's criminal activity prior to attending a meeting with Delbert Coleman to discuss financing for the purchase of the Stardust and Fremont Hotel. Many questioned the accuracy of this claim since Glick attended school with one of Frank's sons. Glick continued by explaining that through the four mob family's influence, he received a loan for nearly $63 million from the Teamsters pension fund. He then used this money to purchase the Stardust and other resorts under his company, Argent Corporation. Teamster later went on to issue a second loan to Glick for $25 million. This loan provided Argent Corporation with the funding necessary to redevelop and improve the Stardust. Glick ended his testimony by claiming his involvement in the skimming conspiracy stemmed from his intimidation of the crime figures. Prosecutors acknowledged his testimony as the truth to the jury, and as a result, Glick got off scot-free. Controversy surrounding the Stardust finally laid to rest in 1985 when Boyd Gaming purchased both the Stardust and the Fremont Hotel. Boyd Gaming had a reputation for abstaining from criminal activity, leading many to view their acquisition of the property as a new beginning. Throughout the 90s, the Stardust underwent several drastic changes. Being one of the last resorts on the Strip from the 1950s, the Stardust underwent a $300 million renovation to modernize the resort in 1991. The renovation plans included adding a new 32-story hotel tower, along with two swimming pools, a golf course, and a athletic facilities. 
One year later in 1992, Boyd replaced the Stardust's famous Lido de Paris show with a less established show known as Enter the Night. While Enter the Night never received the same attention as Lido de Paris, the show stayed with the Stardust for seven years before parting ways in December of 1999. Around the same time, developers also replaced the futuristic lettering on the original sign with blocky typeface lettering. Before the turn of the century, Wayne Newton signed the biggest entertainment deal in Las Vegas history. In October of 1999, Newton signed a 10-year deal with the Stardust for a reported $25 million dollars per year. According to the deal, he would perform exclusively at the Stardust for 40 weeks out of the year. Due to contractual obligations, Newton ceased all performances in the Hollywood Theater at MGM Grand. Following his signing, the Stardust renamed their 920-seat theater to Wayne Newton Theater in his honor. The turn of the century marked the beginning of the end for the Stardust Resort. While the casino retained some of its popularity, it would never be as profitable as the newer mega-resorts built on the Strip. Towards the end of the 1980s, the Las Vegas Strip underwent a gradual transition due to the steady decline in organized crime involvement. Long gone were the days of Rat Pack Vegas as the Strip shifted towards a more commercialized and family-friendly environment. This new chapter in Las Vegas history came to be known as the Mega Resort Era and kicked off in November of 1989 with the opening of Steve Wynn's Mirage. Steve Wynn's Mirage set a new standard for luxury on the Strip and attracted droves of tourists as a result. What followed the Mirage's astronomical success was nearly 25 years of rapid growth and financing for projects. By the start of the 21st century, the era of mega resorts was in full swing, and the Stardust struggled to keep up. In an attempt to become more competitive with the new mega resorts, the Stardust demolished four of the original two-story buildings to make way for a planned $25 million renovation. Renovations done to the resort included upgrading the public facilities and guest rooms, construction of a new 340-seat buffet, and lastly, refurbishment of the property's roadside sign. Regardless of these renovations, the Stardust continued to struggle as newer resorts outshined the once iconic resort. In a last-ditch effort to save the declining resort, Stardust officials brought in magician Rick Thomas as a performer in March of 2005. The following month in April, Newton decided to end his run at the resort four and a half years early. His departure hit the resort hard, despite Thomas's magic show becoming the most successful daytime show on the Strip. Once Newton left the Stardust, no one questioned if the resort was going to close. The question now stuck in everyone's mind was when it would close. By 2004, Boyd officials recognized that the Stardust closure was inevitable. In response, officials created a plan to potentially redevelop the site of the Stardust. In July, Boyd put their plan into action and spent a hefty $1.2 billion on purchasing Coast Casinos Incorporated. This pricey acquisition provided the company with four new properties, the Sun Coast, the Gold Coast, the Orleans, and Barbary Coast. A few months later in November, Boyd purchased a 13-acre parcel located contiguous to the Stardust for $43 million. Between 2004 and 2006, the company purchased several more properties, including the land between the Stardust and the Westward Ho. Towards the end of 2006, a deal was made with Harris Entertainment to trade the Barbary Coast Casino for 11 acres located adjacent to the Stardust. In total, Boyd acquired 87 acres for the Stardust redevelopment. In January of 2006, Boyd Gaming announced to the public that they would be replacing the Stardust and Westward Ho with a new project known as Echelon Place. Boyd described Echelon as a luxurious multi-use complex boasting five partially separated hotel towers with a combined guest capacity surpassing 5,000 people. The project sat on 87 acres and was to contain a 140,000 square foot casino floor, a convention center with close to a million square feet of space, and numerous other amenities. The development expected to become the centerpiece of the northern end of the Strip. With the development of Echelon Place, Boyd hoped to surpass the Mirage and become the leader in luxury on the Strip. Estimated to cost $4 billion if completed, Echelon Place is believed to to be the second most expensive hospitality development ever undertaken. The only project to top Echelon is the Mirage and MGM's $6 billion city center project. Following the announcement, on November 1, 2006, after remaining continuously open for 48 years, the Stardust Resort and Casino finally closed their doors to the public. Once the clock struck noon, the Bobby Howard Band led patrons out of the resort one final time to the tune of When the Saints Go Marching In. After operating for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the Stardust sat eerily quiet and empty for the first time in nearly half a century. On March 13th, 2007, at 2 in the morning, the Stardust was imploded to make way for the planned construction of Echelon Place. The demolition ceremony included a fireworks show displaying a 10-second countdown to the implosion. Despite only 430 pounds of explosive being used in the demolition, the Stardust became the tallest building to be imploded on the Las Vegas Strip. Almost immediately after demolition wrapped up, construction teams began prepping the land for construction. After the prep work was completed, construction officially began on Echelon Place during the summer of 2007. Developers presumed the project would be completely finished by 2010. Towards the end of 2007, the United States began to undergo an economic recession that wreaked havoc on the tourism economy. While established casinos experienced severe problems relating to the recession, planned projects seemingly felt the brunt of the damage. On August 1st, 2008, Boyd Gaming announced that construction on Echelon would be halted for three to four quarters due to the poor economic conditions. Project officials announced that they intended on resuming 
resuming construction upon the recovery of the credit market and the Las Vegas economy. This was bad news for many Las Vegas residents who were relying on the opening of places like Echelon Place to bring jobs to the valley. During the subsequent year, the recession continued to wreak havoc on the valley. Boyd Gaming took a massive hit in 2009 when the company experienced a massive drop in their share prices and revenue. The recession's effect on Boyd's revenue resulted in the company losing millions of dollars in profit. After tough deliberations, Boyd officials concluded that the best course of action was to suspend construction on Echelon Place until the economic conditions in Las Vegas improved. In a statement released by Boyd, the company stated that while they believed in the long-term viability of Las Vegas, the current economic conditions in Las Vegas would not support a project like Echelon Place. The company concluded by stating that construction would not resume anytime soon and that locals should expect construction to be suspended for three to five years. Three years after suspending construction, Boyd Gaming announced that they plan on finishing construction at Echelon Place. Boyd stated this time around, they were determined to claim their spot as one of the top luxury destinations on the Las Vegas Strip. Following this announcement, Clark County granted Boyd an extension till 2018 to finish the project. Plans to resume construction fell through less than a year later in 2013, when Boyd Gaming sold the 87-acre site to the Malaysian gaming company Genting Group for $350 million. Genting Group is a well-respected gaming powerhouse based from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. The company owns several casinos located throughout the world, most noteworthy being the Aqueduct Racetrack Casino in New York City, which contains the world's largest slot machine floor. Genting purchased the site with plans to develop a chinese theme resort on the 87 acres. After the acquisition of Echelon Place, executives from Genting Group received an invitation to attend a local press conference. At the conference, company officials revealed their plan to construct a 21 million square foot chinese themed resort named Resorts World Las Vegas. Upon completion, the project would contain four hotel towers with a combined room count of 6,500 rooms. Aside from the typical shopping and dining areas, developers revealed part of their plan included building a replica Great Wall of China, a panda exhibit, and a 1 million square foot convention center. Company officials stated construction on Resorts World would occur in four phases over the span of 24 to 36 months. Officials also disclosed that phase one of construction would span 8 million square feet and include 3,500 hotel rooms. To reduce construction costs, Genting intended on incorporating the structure of Echelon Place into Resorts World's design. Phase one planned to accommodate numerous features such as a seven and a half acre indoor water park, a 4,000 seat theater, and a bowling alley. Construction on the first phase was expected to cost around $4 billion and break ground in 2014. Genting officials estimated that Resorts World would open by 2016 and alleged the property would supply nearly 12,000 jobs to the valley. Residents of Las Vegas found the announcement of Resorts World to be a pleasant surprise. Although the Great Recession began four years earlier in 2008, Las Vegas was still experiencing its devastating effects. From 2002 until the economic crisis, unemployment in the valley had remained on a steady decline. Before the recession, unemployment in Las Vegas sat around 4%. Two years after the initial onset of the recession, unemployment in the valley skyrocketed upwards of 10%. Throughout this period, of economic crisis, the hospitality industry would suffer greatly from the drastic decline in tourist spending. As a result, many Las Vegas residents lost their jobs and found themselves unable to find new employment. With the announcement of Resorts World Las Vegas, many felt that things might finally turn around for Las Vegas. Resorts World received support from several Nevada government officials, including Governor Ryan Sandoval and Senator Harry Reid. Both Sandoval and Reid praised Genting Group for aiding in the recovery of the Las Vegas economy by providing employment to thousands of people. Construction got off to a rocky start as groundbreaking was delayed until May 5th, 2000. 2015, one year after the initially planned start date. The project now expected to be completed by mid-2018, two years after Resorts World was initially scheduled to open. Shortly after construction broke ground, construction on the project slowed down considerably. As the months wore on, work on the project appeared to be on a steady decline. Genting Group also became increasingly quiet about the project and began only posting construction updates to Facebook. By February of 2016, numerous locals questioned the resort's status, as barely any work had been completed. With the current pace of construction, many doubted the project would open by 2018. In May of 2016, Genting Group announced their plan to ramp up construction later that year. Assuming construction stays on schedule, the company expected the project to be complete by early 2019. Genting attributed the delays to the Malaysian currency's depreciation, which decreased the company's global purchasing power, along with awaiting on approval from the Nevada Gaming Commission for a gaming license. The project sat in limbo for about two years as Genting Group geared up for resuming construction. In 2018, over a decade since Boyd demolished the Stardust to make way for a new development, construction was finally in full swing. In May of 2018, Genting posted an updated timeline for construction on Resorts World, which placed the resort's opening at the end of 2020. Since Genting released the updated timeline, construction has stayed on pace with the aggressive timeline. This is attributed to on-site workers being increased sixfold since the start of 2018. 
Towards the end of July, Genting Group representatives informed News 3 Las Vegas that the two hotel towers now stand 22 and 25 stories tall, more than double their initial height at the start of 2018. The representatives also informed News 3 that both towers will stand 60 stories tall by the end of the year and be topped out in the fall of 2019. In order to remain on pace with the aggressive building schedule, company officials claim that the number of workers will increase daily as construction expands out to different areas. This is good news for the Vegas construction industry, since Resorts World will continually provide more job opportunities as construction advances. As 2018 comes to an end, construction at Resorts World continues to keep up with the aggressive building schedule. While some skeptics believe construction will not be completed until 2021 or later, many locals remain hopeful that the project will continue to stay on track and open on schedule. The northern end of the Strip has been plagued with abandoned developments and declining foot traffic since the initial onslaught of the recession. The Fountain Blue Las Vegas, now known as the Drew, ceased construction in 2008, around the same time Boyd Gaming announced construction on Echelon Place was suspended. Like Resorts World, the Drew is expected to open at the end of 2020. With both projects being highly anticipated, many expect that they will revitalize the northern end of the Strip upon opening. At this point, only time will tell what becomes of the former site of the Stardust. I personally believe that when Resorts World opens, it will be a successful addition to the Las Vegas Strip. Genting Group appears to be studying the market, as well as carefully calculating what to build in order to compete with the already established casinos on the Strip. While the Strip is historically one of the most competitive markets out there, Genting officials should have no issue competing assuming they play their cards right. With proper marketing and generous gaming promotions, Resorts World is poised to take over and dominate the northern end of the Strip. If you enjoyed the video, hit that like button down below. This video was actually a suggestion I received from one of you on one of my latest videos. If you have any suggestions for future videos, let me know down in the comments below. Also, be sure to hit that subscribe button and that bell icon so you can stay up to date on my latest content. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next video. Peace.